Jesus. And today, um, I have the extreme honor of, of introducing to just a few of you uh, a man by the name of Dr. John Bosman. There's many things I could say about John and Ann Bosman. I could talk about their leadership, of how they led one of the fastest growing churches in Louisiana a number of years ago and experienced a great move of God that just exploded that region and that church in a powerful way. I could talk about how he's an author. I could talk about how he is a international leader and, and speaking in a church almost every Sunday of the year in high demand. I remember being with him last year in South Africa uh, where they are, they are natives of South Africa but haven't lived there for a number of decades after they came to the U.S. and became U.S. citizens. And, and though, although they've not lived there for many decades, how regarded and honored they were still in that nation. And there's so many things I could say about Dr. Bosman. I could talk about how he earned his second doctorate just recently, just this last month. Uh, he earned his second doctorate. I mean, he put in the work and earned it. And... Um, But what I want to focus on today, what's more dear to my wife and I, is that he is our pastor. He is the man that prays for us. He is the man that I can call any time, day or night, and I know he will always answer. He and Anne have been there doing Deidre and I's darkest moments in ministry and hardest times. He has always been a support and encourager. He has been a spiritual father and a pastor to your pastor and his wife. We are so thankful for the gift that they are. And when we are with them, we are reminded that there are people around the world that would wish to just have five minutes with them. And so we do our best to steward our time with them. Today, I know it's been a couple of weeks since I've been behind this pulpit preaching. If you could just give us one more week to hear from one of the one of the most powerful prophetic moments of our time. Let's welcome this morning, Dr. John Bosman. Come on, let's give him a strong Victory Church welcome this morning. Thank you very kindly, Pastor Juan. My, 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 what an introduction. I think I need to get you to travel with me all around the world, Pastor. It's great to be back with you again this morning. But let me begin by saying good morning. Good morning. That was almost good. <laughs> Let's try it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John. Your name is? Oh, what a delight to meet you. Great to see you in church this morning. You all look so bright and so lovely uh, and uh, fresh and young. It's great to see all of you smiling and happy in the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Juan, for this wonderful introduction, your invitation to spend to, uh, this evening and this morning with you. We believe that God has something great in store for us. I just need to say quickly, church, I'm sure you do, but I do want to say appreciate your pastors, Pastor Juan, Pastor Deidre. Appreciate them with all and everything. I, I can tell you, my wife Anne and I, we travel all across the nation, preach in a different church every Sunday somewhere, not in another country. We know pastors, we know churches. I need to tell you this morning, and I'm sure you already know that, that you have one of the finest pastor couples in the entire nation. I mean that. And I'm not saying that to give praise to man. We're saying that to give God praise for the gift that he has given to our church here. We give God praise. But uh, I, I said in the first service, I want to say again, uh, the truth is that Juan Rivera would not have been the man he is if it wasn't for Deidre Rivera. 
<laughs> Pastor Juan is certainly one of my favorite preachers. My, my, my. I can listen to him every day. And last year he was with uh, me in South Africa, one of our pastors and leaders conferences where thousands of pastors and leaders gather. And he just rang the bell. I mean, he preached heaven down. <laughs> To the point that what they demanded when we came to uh, organizing this year in October, uh, and we were talking about the schedule, and they wanted to make sure Pastor Juan is coming back. I said, Yes, Pastor Juan will be coming back. They said, We need to put him way at the top. <laughs> and so he's going to be way at the top. He's going to be our speaker in the two keynote moments of that conference. So pray for Pastor Juan as uh, we get ready for that powerful trip. And this year, uh, we will probably be speaking to about somewhere between 40 and 50,000 pastors and leaders. So we do need your prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask my wife to stand. For those that don't know who she is, this is my wife, Anne. I oftentimes feel it necessary to introduce her and tell you it's my wife and not my daughter. <laughs> because she's not only my wife, she's my best friend, my ministry partner, uh, my prayer partner. And I certainly appreciate her. Just like I said about Pastor Deirdre, that's more than true in my life. I would not make it without her next to me. God is good. I said, God is good all the time. And our Heavenly Father, we approach you in this moment in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Lord, let these next few minutes become life changing moments. Speak to our hearts. Enlighten our spirits. Let your word come alive. And let Jesus be glorified. Amen. This morning in our message, I'm going to introduce you to three characters that I'm sure you already know. Then after I've introduced the three and just told you who they are, I will highlight some of their characteristics and then I'm going to speak to you about two contemporary spiritual generations. I want you to go with me to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. And we are going to concentrate on the complete three chapters, the first three chapters of the first book of Samuel. Now, just to put your mind at ease, I'm not going to read through all the three chapters. And I'm not exegetically going to preach about all three chapters. I'm going to highlight, as I said, three characters, three personalities, and then concentrate on two contemporary spiritual generations. Now, as we begin with our introduction in verse number one, we see there was a certain man by the name of Elkanah. In verse 2, it says, Alcana had two wives. And here comes the first character. The name of one was Hannah. So the first character is Hannah that I'm introducing to you. Again, I'm not going to preach on all the verses, all the lines, but everything I'm going to share with you comes out of those three chapters 
and I will suggest that you go back home and read the three chapters and you will see the highlights that we are going to talk about this morning. In chapter 9, uh, verse 9, I'm, I'm sorry, still in chapter 1, verse 9 says, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh where the tabernacle was. Here's the next character. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle. Then we see some descriptions of Hannah again, that she was in bitterness of soul, she prayed, she wept in anguish, she made a vow, she wanted a male child, she felt like the birth of this son was going to be something special, something very unique and something very divine. In verse number nine, 19, in the second part, it says, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time, here comes the third character, Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. So just to recap quickly, is Hannah, there is Eli, and there is Samuel. I'm going to concentrate primarily on Eli and Samuel. But right here at the, in the back of your mind, I want you to remember Hannah. And Hannah, I'm going to use this morning as a type of the church. And I will pretty much close with Hannah in our time together this morning. Now, I'm going to talk to you primarily, as I said, about two contemporary spiritual generations. Now, we all know and realize that the church in modern times is facing tremendous challenges. It's an outright attack on our worship. Fundamentally, it's a battle against Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. But it was Jesus that said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I want to make this declaration with all of us and say, do what you want, say what you want, Attack the way you want, but you will never destroy the church. The church is here to stay. There, there are so many cultural attacks against the church. It's become so sensitive. You've got to be careful what you say from the pulpit. You've got to be careful what you write. You've got to be careful what you broadcast because of the sensitivity of the culture that is being raised to destroy and snuff out the voice of the church. There is political pressure Decisions are being made every day and the bottom line is to silence the voice of the church. I've got bad news for them. You're not going to silence the voice of the church. But we have to make a decision today as the church, as believers, as children of God. Where do we stand? Are we on the Lord's side or are we against what the Lord stands for in totality? Where are we? What do we believe? What is my attitude? 
What will I do when the persecution increases? It is a time for decision. I want to say that again. It's a time for decision. You and I can no longer remain neutral. It is time for the church to rise to the occasion. It is time to take our stand. It is time for us to draw a line in the sand and say, we are on the Lord's side and we will fight for him. Which brings us to the two generations that I want to talk about. I have called them the passing generation and the emerging generation. You say it one more time, the passing generation and the emerging generation. But when I say it like that, I want to make it clear that when I say passing generation and I say emerging generation, it has nothing to do with biological age. It has everything to do with spiritual attitude. What is your spiritual attitude? And I believe that the Holy Spirit is beginning to quicken the church. The Holy Spirit is getting the church ready because I believe with my complete heart that we are headed for the greatest revival we have ever seen in the United States of America. We're, we're getting ready for a great move of God. But at the same time, I've got to tell you, church, not every church is going to experience the move of God. But I believe Victory Church is one of those churches that are going to experience not only a revival, but a spiritual awakening. You believe that? Let me hear you give the Lord a shout of praise. So we're talking about a passing generation and we're going to talk about an emerging generation. So we're going to look at Eli as a model of the passing generation. And we're going to look at Samuel as a type of the emerging generation. I'm not going to keep on saying it, but I do want it to settle. It's got nothing to do with biological age. It has everything to do with spiritual attitude. Now let me use two quick examples. When it comes to passing generation and emerging generation, I'm going to use those two as models, but I want to undergird it with some examples out of the Bible. First of all, we, we will look at somebody that represents the passing generation other than Eli when we get back there. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 14, especially in verse number 10. And here we hear a man by the name of Caleb. And Caleb is making this statement at the end of verse number 10 of Joshua 14. And he says, and now, here I am this day, 85 years old. Now, that means he's not 18, he's 85. And he goes on in verse 11. He says, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, 
So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Verse 12. Now, therefore, give me my mountain. It says, they give me this mountain. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm still ready to tackle that mountain. He says, here I am. I'm 85 years old. I'm still ready for war. I'm still ready to fight. I'm still ready to go into the battle. I'm still ready to declare a victory. I'm 85, but I'm not wasted. I'm 85, but I'm still going. I'm 85, but I'm still running. I'm 85, and I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. I'm not throwing in the towel because my God is a great God and my victory is in the name of the Lord. Oh, come on, somebody. Give the Lord praise in this house. Oh, I believe there we see a great example of a passing generation. Got nothing to do with age. 85. But his attitude is young. And he's alive and ready to go. On the contrary, in the New Testament, we find a, a young man that the Bible refers to as the wrong, rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. He asked Jesus this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus tells him exactly what to do. He responds is in verse 22 of Mark chapter 10. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. Here's a young man, emerging generation, if you'd want to call it that, but that's not, it's a young man. But this young man that had his life ahead of him, that had strength and vitality and energy and good health and everything on his side. He decides this is not for him. And this young man turns around and walks away from the greatest opportunity in his life. So here you see it's got nothing to do with age. A young man can turn away and miss the purposes of God and never see the glory of eternal life. It's got nothing to do with age, but it's got everything to do with a spiritual attitude. So today I'm going to challenge your spiritual attitude. I'm going to ask you, where are you in your spiritual attitude as we are facing this cultural war, this biological, uh, this, uh, biological war, excuse me, uh, that too. Uh, but I'm talking about a political war, unfortunately. It may be biological, but nevertheless, let me tell you, we are here at a place where we're going to have to decide where are we in our spiritual attitude. I, am I ready to give up? Or am I ready to fight? Now fight in a good sense, not fight. But you know what I mean by fight. Where are we? What is your spiritual attitude? Where is your conviction? Where are your priorities? Where, where are our priorities? As we get ready for one of the greatest moves of God that we have ever seen in our entire lives. So let me get back to my characters real quickly. So the first character we, we're going to look at is Eli, and Eli represents the passing generation. A few things that the Bible tells us about Eli in person. He says, it says that Eli was old. Now that is a biological, but I'm going to make the spiritual comparison. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about people that are spiritually old, we unfortunately get to a place where we're not as involved as we should be. I'm talking about a spiritual attitude. Just like this rich young ruler, he had every opportunity but gave up. I want to make this statement. The problem is that many times, many people grow old but they never grow up. They grow old, but they never mature. Spiritually, I'm talking. And I believe in the days that we are facing, 
we are going to need spiritual maturity. And we're going to have to get there so we can take our stand and, 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 and say we will not surrender to the evil that is, is infiltrating this world and especially our country and our nation. But, but also it goes on and it says, Eli was sitting on a stool outside the tabernacle. He was exhausted. And I think there are many people today in the church that are spiritually exhausted. Doesn't matter how young or how, how old you are, you're spiritually exhausted. You, you may have faced some battles, spiritual battles in your life. Again, whether you're 16 or 60, 80 or 80, it makes no difference. You have faced some spiritual battles. You've faced some stuff in your life that felt like it was going to take you out. And you have fought the battle. You've prayed, you've cried. And many times you were ready to give up and throw in the towel. And you've become spiritually tired. But I want to say today, you have a decision. You can sit down on your little stool, exhausted and trying to breathe. Or you can get up and take a deep breath in the Holy Spirit and begin to become an, an on-fire man and woman, young person for God and say, my mountain is before me. Give me my mountain. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I may have come through a battle. I may have come through a valley. I may have faced some difficulties. I may have been discouraged. I may have been falsely blamed and I tried to stand in it but I, I felt like I was going to give in and yet God helped you even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me and you've come through your spiritual battle and I'm saying to you today get up from your chair get up from your situation get up from your rock and begin to walk again because there are great things Things ahead for us in the name of Jesus. Somebody help me shout. Somebody give God praise. Then one verse out of the fourth chapter in verse 18. It's amazing how the Bible records that it does. It says he was fat. He was obese. He was overweight. Well, thank God we're not talking about physical stuff this morning. So I'm talking about spiritual obese. I'm talking about being spiritually fat. I'm talking about being spiritually overfed because if we're not careful we can continue to provide information without transformation and the result is spiritual obese if our information does not result in transformation we are creating a wrong generation. We've got to raise a generation that's spiritually fit to do the work of the kingdom. What does it sound like if you listen to a passing generation that has become spiritually obese? They say things like, I've heard it all. I've seen it all, I've done it all, I bought myself a t-shirt, I sold it at the WM's garage sale, I know about all those things, don't tell me anything, I know it all. Friend, if our attitude becomes such that we think we know it all 
and that we've heard it all and that we have done it all. We are spiritually obese. And being spiritually obese will end up uh, with us sitting on a little stool and eventually sitting on his little stool being so obese he fell over broke his neck and died. I want to say today in the name of Jesus, don't sit on your little stool and be so spiritually obese, but get up out of your stool and begin to move ahead and say, even though I've heard it all, although I have seen it all, I believe the best is yet to come. There are greater victories there are greater battles to come, to overcome. There are victories ahead of me that I've never seen. I know that before us, miracles are waiting. Blind eyes are going to open. Deaf ears are going to become unstopped. Crutches are going to fly through the air. Wheelchairs are going to be emptied. I believe that. Oh, come on, let's take a praise break. Let's just take a one-minute praise break. Oh, come on, let's give God praise. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, quickly sit down. But it also says that he lost interest. Sitting on a stool, spiritually obese, the lamp was going out in the tabernacle, and God's instruction was, the lamp should never die. And if you're not careful, if you continue to sit on your little stool and say, I've heard it all. I've seen it all. I've done it all. Nobody can tell me anything new. The lamp of God is going out in the tabernacle. And God help us if the light goes out. I believe that there are enough people in Victory Church that will say the lamp is not going to go out on my clock. It's not going to go out on my clock. The Holy Spirit is going to stay alive in our church. The Holy Spirit gifts are going to stay alive in our church. The Holy Spirit miracles are going to stay alive in this church. I may not be able to run anymore. I may not be able to do what I've done. But even if I have to stumble, I'm going to keep on going. Because I may not be able to move that fast anymore. But I can still pray heaven come down. I can still fast for a breakthrough. I can still call upon God because I know that he is alive. Come on somebody. The big spiritual application is That the spiritual things were not the highest priority. He was just going through the motions. I know I've got to hurry. But let me tell you, there are too many people today that are just going through the motions. They come to church, soothe their conscience, not necessarily to meet with God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about other churches, not this one. But let me tell you, our priority needs to be again the presence of God the glory of God, not to soothe my conscience, not to jump through the religious hoops, not to do my little exercises in church, but to seek the presence of God. Can I tell you real quickly, 
when you were born again, you were not born again just to go to heaven. When you were born again, you were not born again just to escape hell. You were born again to do the great works of a great God. So ladies and gentlemen, let's begin to march according to the beat of heaven's drum. And give glory to God. The final thing that I want to say about him is that he lost discernment. He could not understand why Hannah was weeping. She came, she was weeping. And she was praying in a travail. She was broken. She was fasting. And as she was praying in her heart, the words were stumbling over her lips. He looked at her and the Bible says he thought she was drunk. She had too much wine to drink. So he's criticizing her. He doesn't have the discernment because he's just sitting on the stool in obesity, exhausted, ready to give up and to give in. But they cannot see what others are going through. And many times we're not careful and we lose our discernment in spiritual obesity. We cannot understand what's happening in other people's lives. We don't understand why are they dancing and jumping we don't understand why are they rolling, why are they crying, why are they shouting, why? It's because we don't discern what God is doing in the spirit. And I'm saying to you today, it's time for us to become sharp again. Just hold off, Just hold off a, a few minutes. Samuel, hold off. I know I just need to tell you ladies and gentlemen we need that discernment and this guy is going to help us in, in, in that keyboard in just a moment you will see because I believe in the emerging generation that we are going to talk about next and the emerging generation we take as the example of Samuel now first of all I want to tell you real quickly that Samuel's birth was supernatural remember we were talking about spiritual attitude I need to tell you that your spiritual birth was supernatural. It's not what you thought. It's not just a few things that you said. It's not a, a decision that you just made. When you were born again, your born again experience was supernatural. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit took up residence on your inside. When you were born again, you became a child of God. When you were born again, your sins were forgiven. Your past was blotted out. It was supernatural. When you were born again, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. When you were born again, you got the assurance that if you had to die tonight, that you are going to heaven. You are no longer hell bound. You are now heaven bound. It's supernatural. It's not just an idea. It's not a denominational thing. It is the truth of the divine works of God in natural man to make us children of the most high God. You are not a nobody. You are a child of God. I said you are a child of God. You are somebody special because you were born as a special person. But then we also see that Samuel was not just born to be born. He was born with a divine assignment. You have a divine assignment. Every child of God, every believer has received at least one Holy Spirit gift. And you and I need to utilize those gifts if all of the church will begin to respond by functioning in the spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Holy Spirit, this building is too small to contain the people that will come. If we don't realize what our spiritual assignment is as children of God, 
we will soon find ourselves only sitting on the stool and missing everything that God has in store for us. So I am here to challenge you to get up, to find your gift if you don't know what it is. Talk to Pastor Juan. Find your gift. Get involved. Function in your Holy Spirit gift. Turn the world upside down. Bring in revival. Bring in a move of God. Glorify God. Magnify him. And you will see the power that is going to be released in this church. But there's one, one special thing that I see about Samuel. And this is that Samuel, while he was in the tabernacle, he lived there. Because he, when, when Hannah gave birth to Samuel, she gave birth to Samuel for a special purpose. Today in our message, we're saying she gave birth to an emerging generation. So he lived in the tabernacle. That's where he slept. That's where he lived. That's where he was. And the Bible says one night Samuel went to bed. And when he was, while he was lying in bed, he heard something. He heard a voice. He got up and ran to Eli, think it was Eli that was calling him. God came to Eli, the passing generation, said to him, Sir, you have called me. Eli says, No, son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes off, gets back into bed, gets back in bed. What happens next time? He hears that voice again. Somebody is calling. He's hearing something from heaven. He doesn't know what it is. So he gets up, runs back to Eli. Eli? You've called me. No, Samuel. I did not call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed. Third time he hears the same thing, gets back up, and he runs over to Eli and says, But sir, you have called me. The passing generation have forgotten what the voice of God sounds like. They, if they've forgotten, in their spiritual obesity, when God speaks. But finally, it dawns on Eli, it could be God. So Samuel, go back to bed, and when you hear it again, respond and say to God, he can speak, you are listening. I'm here to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, God is still speaking. I'm going to say to the emerging generation, I don't know. I don't know about you. Let me say this real quickly. You don't need to be a prolific prophet to know that I'm not 17 years old. If you believe that, I've got the Statue of Liberty to sell you also. But let me tell you, here where I am, I feel like Caleb. I am part of the emerging generation. I said, I am part of the emerging generation. I'm still expecting God to do greater things than I have ever seen. I, have don't, I don't have time to tell you about all the miracles I've seen from a dead man rising up out of a stretcher. I, I can tell you about those things, but I want to tell you, I'm part of the emerging generation. I'm going to see things that I've never seen before. I'm going to experience things that I've never experienced before. I'm going to be in a church somewhere where the glory of God is going to hit the entire congregation. I'm telling you, I am part of the emerging generation. I'm ready for greater things for God. But I want to say, there's something that I'm seeing, Pastor. The emerging generation is hearing something from heaven. We don't quite know what we're hearing. It may be the sound of the abundance of rain. 
It may be the sound of a revival. It may be the sound of a great awakening. We're not quite sure what we're hearing yet, but we know that we know that we're hearing something from the throne room of heaven and we're not going to give up. We're going to keep on going. We're going to believe God because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We're going to keep on going. And I've got to give you good news, Pastor. I believe this congregation sitting before me this morning are all part of the emerging generation. I am speaking. I am speaking to the emerging generation. And by now you understand that I'm not talking about biological age. I am talking about spiritual attitude. And because of that, you may as well get ready for a great move of God. I'm not going to take long, but I do need to touch on Hannah. Because if I don't, I miss a great part. I apologize for going a little over time. I think I am. Thank you. Hannah, we said, is a type of the church. What is it that gave birth to the emerging generation? It was the church. Hannah gave birth to Samuel. The church gave birth to the emerging generation. I'm here to say to you this morning, it takes a church that's committed to God that will bring forth the fullness of an emerging generation. I feel in my spirit that God God is releasing and giving birth through this church to an emerging generation wherein we won't only see the release of a mighty revival, but we're going to see a great awakening. I need to tell you what I sense in the spirit. What's going to happen is that people are going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west being drawn by the spirit of the emerging generation. But what is it going to take? What is it going to take? It's going to take a church that will pray that will be in a veil that will fast that will weep until something happens it doesn't happen by itself it happens by surrender it happens it happens when God releases his spirit and a church begins to say we're going to fast we're going to pray if we want to fast and pray we can do it all through the night day and night we're gonna pray and pray and pray and fast and weep until something happens stand with me please I'm not quite through preaching but stand with me I'm gonna close with this I feel like I'm beginning to shake. Anne knows what that means, and I know. God is getting ready to show up. If you look at Hannah, you will see what marks her life. His brokenness. 
when brokenness comes over the church, revival is the next move. When you hear the travail and the weeping and the sobs, you can get ready. God is getting ready to break through. I don't want to take a long time other than to just briefly tell you that there was a time in my life as a pastor when I became hardened. No, I was not in sin. But brokenness was no longer there. And when I realized that, that I can face traumatic things and I don't even get sad. I don't get broken. I began to cry out to God. And I pleaded with him. Oh God, please give me brokenness. And I know sometimes we're afraid to ask God to give us brokenness because we think that if we ask to, for God to give us brokenness, he's going to slap some cancer on us or take us, a loved one away in death or some tragedy like this. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the God that we serve. God will never do that. Brokenness means when you in contrite surrender, your heart is broken and you, can, and you begin to weep and you don't even quite know what and why are you weeping? I pleaded with God. Please, God. I paced the floor. Walked in my home. Walked in our church. Walked around the circle. I prayed, God, please give me brokenness. It seemed like the more I prayed, the less it happened. And one Sunday morning, I was standing behind the podium. The church was packed. There were thousands of eyes fixed on me. 130 camera lights were on. The cameras were rolling. The live broadcast microphones were alert. And I'm standing there and I can't get a word out because from deep down on my inside, there was a brokenness that was rising. And as that was happening, I began to plead with God, but this time I was pleading, God, please, not here, not now. God, this place is packed with people, cameras are rolling, microphones are live, lights are on. There are doctors and lawyers and professors and all kinds of people. God, please, not now. God just bluntly ignored me. And the brokenness continued to rise and rise and rise. I'm not going to go through the whole process. I don't want to waste your time. I began to sweat. I, I, I began. I began to sweat, and and I thought to myself, I'm going to I'm going to collapse or something. People were looking at me. My my ushers thought I was getting a heart attack or something. I turned as white as a sheet. And I was sweating. They they didn't know what was going on. And this brokenness kept on coming and coming and coming until finally it just broke out of my mouth and I started weeping and weeping. I, I clenched the pulpit. I hold, held on to it as tight as I could. I was shaking like a reed and I was bawling and I was crying to the point where I could no longer stand on my feet and I fell down on my face and when I fell down on my face shaking as I was crying the devil was right there and he was saying to me ha ha today you're making a fool of yourself today you're going to lose this church today this community is going to make a laughing stock of you 
and, and I literally almost believed that. I tried to raise myself away from the floor, but it was like a hand slapped me back down on the floor, and I lay there, and I broke, and I wept, and I wept, and I wept, and it felt so good. I said, God, I don't care if I lose this church. I don't care if everybody leaves. I don't care. God, what I'm sensing now, money cannot buy. And then I actually heard how the people were getting up out of their pews. I heard the movement over their huge auditorium. I heard my choir with robes and everything behind me, walking past me. And I said, yeah, there they go, there they go. The whole church is going, everybody's leaving. But that's fine, God. This is you. I don't want to miss what you're doing. I'm not going to miss what you're doing. They tell me it was more than an hour later. They picked me up from the floor and I was shaking like a reed. I lifted up my head. And then I realized nobody had left. The movement that I had heard were people getting out of their seats. They were laying, lying on their faces down the aisles. They were in between the pews weeping with me. I looked around the stairs. My choir had come out of the loft and they couldn't even reach the floor. They were lying on the stairs crying out to God. They looked like bats with their choir robes lying on the stairs. But they were weeping and weeping and broken and screaming. And for the next six weeks, there was a spirit of brokenness in that church. I came prepared every Sunday with a fresh message, but I could not preach one of them. When I got up to preach, the Holy Spirit will move in. Brokenness will come. And people will flock to the altar asking, what must we do to be saved? I wonder if there are any people in this church this morning I wonder is there somebody in this church this morning that will say God I'm not confined by the clock but by your will I wonder if there's anybody in this room that will get out of your seat. I'm walking down the aisle. Fall on your face if you want to go on your knees or just stand. But you're saying, Lord, here am I. I'm ready. And I give myself to you all the way from the back all the way to the front. I'm only going to ask this one time. Just come. If you are ready for a move of God. Just come. That's right, just come. Keep coming. Today, we decide. Today, the line is drawn in the sand. That's right, people are still coming. Don't hold back.
I'm waiting because I see more people coming down. I don't want you to miss this moment. That's right, just keep coming. I'm not going to prolong this. In the next few moments, you will sense the glory and the presence of God come upon you. Everybody in the front, please listen to me. Whether you're on your face, whether you're kneeling, or whether you are standing, I want you to say to God, why are you here? Why are you on your face? Why are you kneeling here? Why are you standing here? But I don't want you to think that. I want you to say that. Use your tongue. Use your breath. Use your mouth. Speak it. Speak it. Tell God, God, I am standing here right now because. And then you tell God, why are you here? Those of you in the audience, thank you for staying. You're free to stay as long as you want to. If you feel like you have to go, that's fine. I understand. But if you want to remain here in the presence, I welcome you. If you still want to come down, feel free to do so. But I want all of us to experience the glory of God. Now those of you in the front, lift both of your hands up high if you can. I want you to begin to look up. You've been looking down long enough. Those of you in the audience that want to do the same, feel free. I don't want to exclude anyone with your hands raised and your head raised. I want you now to raise your voice and tell God why you're here and ask Him to give you a spirit of brokenness, a spirit of discernment or whatever it may be. Just speak to Him right now. Let God begin to do a work on your inside. Let God begin to do a work on your inside, God, right where I am. Right where I am, God. Right here where I am, God. Oh, God, change me for me. Mold me, make me Lord, God. I want to go ahead. I want to go forward. I want to be part of the emerging generation. But it's going to take a church. It's going to take me, oh God. It's going to take me, oh God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Every person with sincerity in your heart. I want you to get ready to pray in the spirit as you have never prayed before. I want you to pray out loud. I don't want you to shout, but I do want to, you to pray out loud. But I want you to pray with your heavenly tongue 
And if you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit and you don't have the heavenly language yet, this is your time to believe God and to speak forth and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I'm asking you now, lift both of your hands. If you physically can't do it, lift both of your hands as high as you can get it. And now lift your voice as loud as you can without shouting and begin to pray in the Spirit. Come on, let me hear you. Pray a little louder. I know you can pray louder. Let's go. Come on, pray with power. Pray with power in the name of Jesus. Pray with power. Rimorosembrabahaya Rababoho God, I give you glory and praise. Hamboroshika, Rimbana Mahana. That's right, church. Lift your voice. Pray in sincerity. Don't hold back. Pray with power. Pray with power. Rimbarumo Sandra Boho Yalabahaya Now, with what you have in your spirit now, I want you to turn to one single person. I want the two of you to stand face to face with each other. And then you lay your hands on the sides of the head of the person in front of you and ask God to give them a fresh oil anointing. To find one person, stand in front of that person you find yourself that there's not a single person just join two people and the three of you pray together that's fine now pray God anoint my husband my wife my friend my brother my sister with fresh oil right now and let there be a release of the glory and the presence and the power of God in every life. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Mighty God, we give you praise, we give you praise, we give you praise. Jesus, we give you praise, dear God. Lift it. That's right, pray with sincerity right now. Pray that God will do something powerful in his or her life. Pray that God will change them. Pray that God will bring them to the fullness of his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, we hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now lift your hands. Lift your hands and give glory and praise to God. Just lift your hands when you're through praying and begin to honor God, begin to praise Him, begin to worship Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. A new day, a new season, hallelujah. Just go ahead, just go ahead, find somebody to pray with. Come on, just find somebody to pray with. Turn around, walk over to somebody, find somebody to pray with. Hallelujah. A passion, a passion for your name. 